The Elder Race Part 4. Toy Soldiers. Thirty years after the Karuk Incident. Mars. Training Compound 6541L. Carlos ate when he was told to eat, drank when he was told to drink, and trained when he was told to train. He knew that he would die when he was told to die, as well. His body was tall and wide and strong. Genetically engineered to be faster, stronger and better than the humanity of old. He knew nothing beyond the stark white walls of the training compound. He knew nothing of compassion or warmth or love. Mercy was as foreign a concept to him as fine dining. His whole world was violence, or the preparation for violence. All he had was his duty to protect and serve the human race. There was nothing else. Carlos was ten years old. Okay, boys and girls. This is your final mock battle before you get your big kid boots. Muttered the sergeant, his voice loud and clear in their ears. If you're too fucking dumb to figure it out, you're blue team. Your goal is to survive. The simulation is as follows. Your CO is down. You are scattered across the battlefield. You must regroup and perform a fighting retreat to Extraction Point Alpha. There you will either defend your ground or pull back to Extraction Point Beta. If any of you make it back, the whole unit passes. It is the red team's job to stop and incapacitate you. They are fully trained military experts. Expect no mercy. Any questions? Carlos raised his hand. Trainee Carlos. Are there any unacceptable actions to take? Survive by any means necessary, Trainee Carlos. Yes, Sergeant. Nothing else? The 100 trainees stayed quiet. The sergeant harumphed to himself. Move to your pods, maggots. No mercy. Carlos and the rest of the trainees saluted and performed a precise about turn, before marching to their drop pods. These weren't real drop pods, Carlos knew. The staging area that they were in now was directly above the battle floor, which artificially simulated terrain for each training exercise that took place there. The pods operated on tracks in the ceiling, which moved the pods to their designated positions before dropping the payload to the floor below. The drop countdown began, and Carlos slipped on his helmet, waiting a second for the HUD to jump into action. He'd be relying on it for all the information that he would need to make it to the extraction points the most crucial being the direction that they lay. He hefted his stun rifle, checking that the safety was off and the magazine charge was full. This rifle fired stunning rounds that electrified an opponent and knocked him unconscious. These rounds wouldn't do shit to someone in full battle armor, so for these exercises they were outfitted with training armor that felt like and operated the same as battle armor did, but offered next to no protection. 8. 7. 6. The first time Carlos had made the drop, he'd been a nervous seven-year-old boy with a body that didn't match. This was the last training drop, and Carlos was equally nervous. This was the last one. After this, he'd be put into active duty. He'd actually step beyond the white walls of training compound 6541L. 2. 1. Carlos was flung against his straps as the drop pod shot downwards and slammed into the ground. The harness retracted. The pod hatch flew open and Carlos shot out aggressively, his weapon up and ready. His landing was greeted with nothing, no enemies were in his immediate line of sight. He could hear distant stun fire ahead of him. He immediately took cover behind a dilapidated concrete pylon that had fallen on its side and began to take stock of his situation. It looked like he hadn't been detected by Red Team yet, but he couldn't count on that to be a stable premise. They could just be waiting for a better shot. He was on his own, without backup. The terrain favored the red team immensely. It looked like they were fighting in a war-torn city. The walls were pockmarked with bullet holes, and the great amount of structural damage was evident. No doubt thanks to a great deal of hypothetical shelling. Red team who had had time to prepare were most likely camped out in the buildings on both sides of the street ahead, waiting to rain fire down on whoever was stupid enough to stroll casually down the pockmarked road. Carlos was not going to be stupid. He keyed into his battle net and studied what his squad mates were doing. So far, they had maintained radio silence, probably only linking into squad members who were within 100 meters of themselves. They were linked together into groups of five and six and quickly moved towards the extraction point. They were making great headway. That meant only one thing. Sharkshooters. 
Just then a whole group of friendly indicators went dark, Carlos thought quickly. The main force most likely lay in wait around extraction point Alpha, hoping to ambush any trainees foolish enough to make the dash for the open ground there. Sharkshooters were probably placed strategically throughout the buildings, working in concert to decimate the blue team ranks before they reached the extraction port. There was little in the way of cover at the objective, as Carlos could see on his holographic map, which meant that their orders had been misleading. In order to survive they not only had to reach the extraction point, but also destroy the garrisoning force that defended it, otherwise they would be wiped out in the open field waiting for evac. There was no one near Carlos and he had landed ridiculously close to extraction point Alpha. That meant that there was probably a large red team presence nearby. The dilapidated buildings ahead of him were probably crawling with enemy troopers. This gave him three options. Move into the occupied zone and covertly clear a path for the rest of the trainees. Retreat and link up with a newly formed squad. Or stay where he was and wait for an opportunity to present itself to him. Carlos didn't much like the idea of linking up with another squad. The risk of getting picked off by a sharpshooter was too great and neither did he like the idea of just sitting still and waiting for someone to find him. As he fought, another two groups of blue team indicators went dark on the battle net map. That was 15 down in 10 minutes. Carlos sighed, and opened up his comlink. This is trainee Carlos to all blue team members. I'm assuming command. All newly formed squads establish a hierarchy and code name. Sound off. There were no voices raised in protest of this command and a hierarchy was established quickly and efficiently within the surviving squads. Everyone had been together for three years living in close proximity. They all knew who was the best at what and their comparative strengths and weaknesses. Alpha Squad, ready. Bravo Squad, ready. Charlie Squad, ready. This continued all the way down to November. Carlos nodded to himself. Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. You're the assault team. You will immediately begin clearing the buildings in your vicinity, branching out as you go. You're hunting for sharpshooters. Stay low and hit the doors hard. I don't want a single enemy rifle aimed at the street. Delta through golf. You will provide support for the assault team as they clear the area. All other squads, dispatch your best scouts to my location and establish a perimeter around extraction point Alpha and dig in. You will be the containment team. I don't want any more reds slipping out to give us any trouble while we mop up. No mercy. The red team leader, aka Lieutenant Ibrahim Al-Zahar, had run through this simulation a hundred times, and it always went one of two ways. The trainees would either splinter off into small 4-8 man squads and try to sip through the cracks or form into one or two very large forces and simply attempt to batter their way through. Every attempt was always met with abject failure. This simulation was designed so that no one would survive. It was not a question of surviving at all, but merely a question of how long a trainee could hold out under the threat of complete annihilation from a superior force in numbers, experience, and training. Throughout the history of this final test, no one had even made it to extraction point Alpha, much less survived. Lieutenant Al-Zahar remembered his own ordeal very well. It was a memory that stuck with him despite all the other horrors that military service had thrown in his face. Screaming hopelessness in the face of overwhelming aggression. The knowledge that victory was impossible. And that there was no escape. These things stuck with him. Even when he was faced with his own death on many other occasions, he looked back at his final test and knew that there was nothing worse than that. Despite the problems that the trainees were facing as they braced for a textbook defeat, Lieutenant Al-Zahar found himself feeling rather bored. He had done this so many times without any real problems, that it was almost a relief when the indicators showing his sharpshooter positions started going dark. Hello, Al-Zahar thought. This batch could be a little bit of fun. Sir! Report, Corporal. Sir? The enemy is flushing out our shock shooters. We've The corporal's next words were drowned out by a storm of stun fire from the buildings across from the boulevard. The men around him dove for cover and immediately returned fire. The immediate vicinity became an intensely flashy light show that seemed to spread rapidly along the boulevard like a wave. As soon as the defenders returned fire, stunning rounds focused on their positions and pinned them down. They were forcing each defender to reveal their position. These trainees were trying to find a kill zone. 
It was textbook tactics, but only if you knew that there was a kill zone and that there was no hope of remaining undetected and reaching it. They'd smell the trap straight away. Somebody in the trainee corps was a clever little fledgling. Al-Zahar smiled and linked into the battle net. A fun time was a fun time, and he would love to see whatever tactics these kids were about to pull. But he had a reputation to uphold. He wouldn't be the first commander in history to let a bunch of kids school him on the battle floor. All shark shooter units, go to ground. He watched as the men under his command began immediate retreats to the edges of the map to receive further orders. They would be active again very soon. Patch me to air command. This is Al-Zahar to Air Command requesting immediate simulation of concussive orbital strikes on the following positions. Al-Zahar then highlighted a large swathe of ground some 60 meters out from the edges of his perimeter, squarely on top of the known trainee positions. Concussive package confirm. Al-Zahar watched with satisfaction as ceiling-based turrets opened up on the trainee positions, sending up great plumes of dust and grit. There would be wounded in this display, beyond those knocked unconscious by the stun rounds, maybe even a few deaths if he was unlucky enough. Broken bones and internal bleeding were common occurrences in training sims. Nothing that the marvels of modern medicine couldn't fix. The only thing modern medicine couldn't fix was death. These kids were a valuable military resource, and if any of them died in this he would no doubt be chewed out by his superiors. But that's all that would happen. Everyone knew how stringent and inherently dangerous the tests had to be in order to make the steel soldiers that humanity needed to survive the things to come. Sometimes, people just die. With the trainee position effectively broken and the survivors stuck out in the open, Al-Zahar decided to show the children one last thing, just to show them who was boss. Release the hounds. Pandemonium. That was the only word that Carlos felt really encapsulated the situation that the trainees in the containment team found themselves in. Their cries of pain and panic almost drowned everything else out on the battlefield. He felt for them. He truly did. But the noise was unnecessary. Not only was it unnecessary, but it was a detriment to the morale of the rest of his men. They were a necessary sacrifice to make in concealing the rest of his plan from the Red Leadership. He knew that the Red Leader would respond to a position right on his doorstep with overwhelming force, shock, and awe. That was just human nature. Obliterate the threat. Search for another. He also knew that the Red Leader would believe that this simulation would be a walk in the park. He'd be complacent. He thought he was just fighting a bunch of kids. The Red Leader would believe that the entirety of the trainee force had taken shelter in those buildings and immediately use search and destroy tactics to hunt down the survivors. If he drew out the Red Team from their positions, then maybe the rest of the trainees would have a chance. He turned to look out the window of the building he and his scouts had occupied, the strict and unconscious bodies of those members of Red Team unfortunate enough to have been stationed there lying at their feet and watched as the trainee position across the street was overrun by Reds and AAL. They looked to be Mark VII units. Carlos whistled quietly to himself. Mark VII's were essentially the best II units you could get in the Terran military, i.e. meaning assault artificial intelligence. Hunters, these units were designed specifically for pursuit situations against an enemy, that had been just recently shattered by shock and awe tactics. They were basically great big metal dogs that were faster and meaner than anything you'd ever met with the added bonus of mounted turrets. They would chase you to the end of time. An I unit gets your scent and you got two options. Fight, and win, or lose, and die. There was no run. They had well and truly earned their military designation, Hellhound. Carlos muted the racket that the containment team was making and keyed into the assault and support team's private battle nets. Okay, kids. The containment team has been overrun. We have reds out in the open. Hit them fast and hit them hard. Be advised there are anywhere between 10 and 30 Mark VII hellhounds operating in the area. Hit them with EMP and concussive grenades, flashbangs, everything you've got. Shoot anything that moves. I want everything down and out in the first minute. Don't give them any time to dig in. They dig in, we lose. He steeled his heart and turned away from the window. He had no doubt that a few trainees had died in that barrage. He would mourn later. Right now, he had to be steel. He had to sacrifice everything to get the job done. Everyone dressed? He asked his scouts. 
They all nodded in assent, absentmindedly smoothing down the red team uniforms and indicator beacons that they had looted from the downed reds stationed in this building. I know how good you are at covert actions, so let's keep this brief. You're to operate in two man cells and clear out the enemy positions. Search and destroy, and use hand-to-hand -hand takedowns, wherever possible. Don't let them see you. If they see you pretend you're a red, use and abuse the element of surprise for as long as possible. That's all we've got. We're outmanned and outgunned in every possible way. Do not forget that. Keep moving and don't get pinned down. Carlos paused. Any questions? Silence. Okay, let's go get them. No mercy. No mercy, came the muted reply. Mars. Training Compound 6541L. Battle Floor Observation Deck. Andrum Winchester snorted in amusement as an indicator after the indicator went dark. This was certainly the most bloodthirsty and innovative final test that he had seen in a long time. With the necessary destruction of their client race, Winchester House had deemed it necessary to invest heavily in artificial life facilities and genetic modification labs. The results of such an investment were very promising, if this battle floor simulation was anything to go by. If the Winchesters were going to begin the reclamation economically and socially disadvantaged, thanks to their efforts in ridding the universe of their own mistake, then they had to make up for those disadvantages in the military domain. They simply had to use this chance to claim as much usable space as possible to forge the House of Winchester into the political, economic, and martial giant that it once was. This was especially true after the board had deemed it necessary to remove a whopping 98% of conquered Karak space from Winchester control, and place it at the feet of the other houses, newling infants that they were. Beautiful specimens, aren't they? Andrew asked Dimitri smugly. Kerchenko House had risen admirably in the political ranks after Dmitri had taken control of the whole debacle as the interim chancellor of the board, but still counted itself below Winchester House in the grand scheme of things. No one on the board could possibly forget the sacrifices that blood as old as he had made in the name of humanity. Sacrifices that the Winchesters would willingly make again. For the right price. War had always been the true calling of the Winchester men and women. Yes, they are. Dimitri replied wonderingly. They're ten years old, you said. Indeed, they are. We've been at this for a very long time, and I'm afraid we've gotten rather good at it. They're tremendously loyal, strong, fast, and brave. They're trained to think quickly and respond to situations accordingly, without putting the main objective into jeopardy. They will fight to the death for the survival of humankind. They, my dear friend are the greatest military asset we could ever field. More than ships, guns, or great weapons of mass destruction, it is these fine men and women that will be safeguarding our future. Children, Dimitri corrected absentmindedly. I beg you pardon. Children, not men and women, children. Out of necessity, yes. Oh, I am not denying that all this is necessary. I was the one who enacted this horrible piece of legislation in the first place. I am looking forward to the day that this is no longer necessary, and hopeful for a time that something of this magnitude will never be necessary again. We have stripped ourselves of what it is that makes us human, all in the name of taking our rightful place. The conversation paused as they watched the final moments of resistance play out on the observation screens. The last trainee left standing fled through the maze of back streets and bombed out carcasses that made up the ruins of the once great city. Incidentally, it was the trainee Carlos. Even now, hounded on all sides by hellhounds and pursuit troopers, he attempted to make his way to extraction point Alpha, only to be headed off by the appearance of yet another pursuer. They were toying with him. Carlos, the third generation trainee of the Winchester Marine Corps, had put up a terrific fight. He had fought tooth and nail to get Blue Team to the extraction point, only to have it torn apart and scattered in the wind, just when victory had been within his reach. He would no doubt be groomed for command after this, but the crippling defeat would most likely stay with him until the end of his days. As it should. Finally, the Red Team had had enough, and they unceremoniously gunned him down with a hail of stun fire. Dimitri took a moment to consider, then turned to Androm. 
That child is ten years old, and he threw his fellow trainees into the meat grinder to get the job done. I can't fault you for your dedication to the cause, and I doubt I ever will. I see now that every action you take is for the protection of mankind. What I can say is that once the 40 years mandated by Protocol 223 are over, we will shut down every facility of this kind. You have made remarkable soldiers to serve the cause, but that boy, Dimitri said, pointing to Carlos' unconscious form, is as much monster as man. I refuse to allow more of his kind than strictly necessary. Andrum stared back at Dimitri, trying to keep the distaste from his face his eyes made from flint and ice. Every one of them was a coward. Didn't they remember? Didn't they know what was out there? I can understand why the other members of the board would think this way. I assure you that I will comply with the dictates of the Charter. I also assure you that I will also do everything I can legally do to ensure that facilities like these remain operational and firmly within the hands of Winchester House. I see. No, Chancellor. I don't think you do. Andrum snapped, before reining himself in. He was being stupid. He took a breath and continued, in a much calmer tone. The calamity left a scar on us all. It showed us how weak we truly are. I strongly believe that soldiers like Carlos are the answer. Of course. Dimitri nodded. Of course. But we must consider the cost. We will discuss it in the boardroom when next we meet. I will take your concerns to the houses that made the complaints about your facilities in the hope that our next board meeting will be far smoother. Dimitri turned and left, leaving Andrum to ponder the gutted city on the battle floor. The board was far too weak to get the job done. That weakness had almost exterminated the entire species. It had killed his sister and his mother. It had torn his children from his arms as surely as the calamity ever had. He would not allow its recurrence. Something must be done. Battle station, lost brother. Militarized border zone. And Oren controlled space. Arkutu sipped at his fit tea more to hide his smugly jubilant smile rather than to partake in its slightly narcotic effects. It had taken 37 cycles of pandering, nagging, and outright bullying to get the damn zone built. Now he had hundreds upon hundreds of roving planet cracker class battle stations under council command, purely for the defense of his race against the human threat. These monstrous creations could punch mag accelerated metal slugs right through planets with barely any loss in velocity to the fired round. They had thousands of missile banks and state of the art point defense. The shields could resist the force of a supernova. The sensory array could locate a borst fart on either side of the galaxy. They were beautiful. The effort that our Q2 had had to go through to make this happen belied words. It made his head swim just to remember it. Dozens of races had to cooperate in building the greatest military force in recorded galactic history. And it was all over. Finished. Our Q2 took another sip. Of course, this was a celebratory occasion but it wouldn't do to have one of the longest serving Andoran patriarchs grinning like a fool for all the galaxy to see. With difficulty, Arkutu brought himself under control. This was a very publicized unveiling event. This would show the rest of the council races that they were safe. They would return to Andoran space and spend their hard-earned cash and re-energize an economy that had nearly been completely annihilated by the twin burdens of the human threat and the construction of the zone. He needed to at least seem professional. He turned his attention to the stage, where a handsome Karak female was preparing to perform. She held a bulbous instrument, and plucked at the strings, diligently attempting to tune the thing to her liking. Arkutu believed the instrument was called Grand Lyre or something along those lines. Its strong mournful notes were designed to counter the chirpy quality that most Karak voices had when they attempted to sin. Arkutu knew this because literally every Karak still alive lived on these stations, and he had thus been extensively trained in their customs and culture. The broken species would be the first line of defense for his own. The female finally looked up, and took a breath. It seemed she had finally got the damn thing tuned. She began to play. Softly. Mournfully, it even managed to tug at Arkutu's own calloused heart, insincere and unfeeling in the face of everything he had seen. It had to be. 
That was how you got the job done. The tea he had been sipping reacted to the melodies emerging from the female's hands, and Arkatu found himself lost in the melancholy timbre. And then the Karak began to sing in a chirpy, whistly rasp that fit in just right, like it was always supposed to be there. Various croaked, and Various choked, hugging his life so dear. He was young and lost, alone, with no one there to hear. We screamed and cried. He burnt and died. A toy soldier lost in the void. Various shouted, and Various cursed, the gods that drove him to this, the gods that came and burnt his world, the gods that brought the abyss. We screamed and cried. He burnt and died, a toy soldier lost in the void. Various left, Various is gone, gone to join his brothers in red. He bought our lives with all he had, paid for in full by the dead. We screamed and cried. He burnt and died, a toy soldier lost in the void. Yes, Arkutu thought, this had indeed been bought by the dead. And there was going to be more pain to come. But this time he hoped to buy the survival of his people with human lives. This time would be different. 